Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Found My Fitness podcast. I am sitting here with Dr. Eric Verdin, who is the president of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. Now, I recently saw a quote from you that uh, said you stated that a child born in the year 2007 had a 50% chance of living to be 104 years old. First yes. of all, yes, you did. Can you explain what you mean by that? Because that's pretty exciting. Uh, I think it says what it says. It's based on the projection of where um, the progression and lifespan that has happened during the last 100 years, which has been about two years per decade. Uh, I think scientists at Berkeley actually have been able to, uh, th this data is, comes out of a book uh, that was based on, on data from Berkeley, suggesting that uh, a, a child born in 2007 has a 50% chance of living to 104. After reading that quote, I was thinking, well, maybe some of these lifestyle interventions that we know to regulate the aging process that we know that can have a positive effect on uh, health span. Can you um, exp maybe tell people a little bit about what are some of the main lifestyle interventions that are known to regulate the aging process, at least in uh, animal models? Yes, uh, and in humans as well. I think there are, you know, four broad categories of, of things that are being considered by the aging field. One is exercise, is to this day the surest, best intervention that we have to increase health span and lifespan. Uh, the second one is nutrition, and there's a lot of research uh, going on today trying to understand what is it about nutrition? Is it carbohydrates versus fat versus proteins? What is the relative, relative role of all these nutrients in your lifespan and health span? The third one, which is actually an active field of investigation, is the identification of molecules that mimic either exercise or sort of exercise mimetic or mimic uh, uh, restriction in terms of nutrients or the, what we call calorie restriction mimetics. And finally, the last part of the, the whole aging field is the, the idea of rejuvenation. So the first three approaches are geared towards um, slowing, slowing down the process of aging. Rejuvenation uh, takes the, the, the approach that once the aging has occurred, how can you repair it and, uh, and how can you fix it? So I think, you know, we have programs here that are studying all four different approaches. I think you're probably familiar with Jack LaLanne, who was the, you know, one of the gurus that started the American uh, sort of uh, infatuation with exercise. And he said he lived to 100 years old. And uh, he, uh, he said that um, exercise is king, nutrition is queen put them together and you have a kingdom, which I think is, is really true. So I think it's, you know, for me and, and many of my colleagues, I think exercise and nutrition is the cornerstone of what we're trying to do today mm -hmm. until we, we have better drugs. That's a, it's a beautiful quote. And in terms of the nutrition, when I think of nutrition, and you mentioned, you know, the macronutrient content, and trying to understand the ratios of carbohydrates and, and protein and um, fat, um, I'll, I often think of the, the micronutrients when I think of nutrition. I train my mentor for my postdoc was Dr. Bruce Ames. Uh -huh. And he, of course, you know, he's very sure. focused on uh, micronutrients, vitamins, yes. minerals, essential yes. fatty acids, and amino acids. Um, but, but, you know, in, in the past, you know, couple of decades, the, the research has seemed to have shown that, you know, limiting these certain macronutrients, you know, protein, uh, fat, carbohydrates, you sort of tweak the amount that you take in you can alter uh, the way an animal ages, at least in terms of um, the way their tissues are aging. You're not necessarily going to, you know, increase their maximum lifespan, yes. but you may increase their average lifespan, which is yes. I think we, in the last 20 years, we've learned a lot, and a, a lot of this research has been actually causing a reevaluation of some of the public policies that have been enacted in the last. 20 and 30 years in terms of what should we, you should, what should you eat, when should you eat. So a lot of work is, is ongoing today and actually generating lots of really interesting data. Uh, along with this, the basic science of aging, I think what people have, have studied is trying to understand what are the pathways that control aging in, in C. elegans, in Drosophila, the fruit flies, and the little nematode, or in, in mice. One of the major pathways that has emerged is uh, insulin signaling pathway. That was the work of Cynthia Kenyon back in the 1990s, showing that the insulin signaling pathway is one of the major pathways that controls aging. 
Well, if you know this, you can already sort of backtrack and say, well, what does insulin do? It's the major hormone that allows you to utilize carbohydrates. And so the implication of this is the more carbohydrate you eat, the more you activa activate the insulin signaling pathway. And the prediction would be that the more, the faster you age. And I think the real data really suggests this model. Now, it flies completely in the face of what we've assumed to be correct. You can walk into any, any store and find low-fat diet and low-fat products. Turns out that we really believe that the culprit is more carbohydrates. And uh, a recent paper just came out, which is really remarkable, showing analyzing in, in, in thousands of humans a fraction of their total calorie intake that is represented by carbohydrate. And they were able to, so just by interviewing them and asking, you know, what, what do you eat? And what they showed in this paper is the all-cause all mortality was directly correlated to the amount of carbohydrate that one eats. So the people who ate the least amount of carbohydrate showed the lowest uh, all-cause mortality. Wow. Was which, it, did they differentiate between refined carbohydrates and, for example, vegetables, which are carbohydrates? They did. They didn't. And I think, uh, you know, this is obviously not all carbohydrates are created equal, mm -hmm. but uh, I think... Possibly Irres a confounder. Irrespective, though. irrespective, uh, total carbohydrate was a very strong predictor. Wow, uh, yeah. But obviously, you know, if you, uh, your total carbohydrate intake is, it, it, it's very hard to eat a high amount of carbohydrates that are all um, uh, sort of a low uh, absorption type of carbohydrate. So th typically the people who eat a lot of carbohydrate will eat a lot of the bad ones as right. well. Yeah, most people that are eating that are probably eating uh, more of a, a standard sort of American diet, you know, where it's you know, chips and crackers and cookies. And, and um, I think people that are following more like of a paleolithic type of diet where they're eating, you know, whole foods and meat and yes. nuts and probably would eat their carbohydrate intake. The bulk would be from vegetables. Absolutely. And, um, things like that. So, but you're you're mentioning a really important point is that you know the, the carbohydrate intake and the rate, you know the insulin signaling pathway. Um, you know these these things. Carbohydrates regulate that, but also you limit your carbohydrate intake when you're fasting. Yes, correct. I mean, you and, limit all of your intake. Well, yeah, all of it. Yes. Essentially, yeah. But but uh, you certainly um, your your insulin uh, signaling goes down, yes. right? And and um, Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, fast, cause fasting is one of the well-known, you know, dietary interventions yes. to, that can regulate um, the way we age. Yes. And a key question about fasting is there's growing evidence um, that it is beneficial. Intermittent fasting, episodic fasting can actually elicit a response in our bodies and, and many animal models that, that are protective against aging. The question is, how does it happen? Okay. So fasting is... Um, is as growing evidence that it actually increases a lifespan and health span. Um, and so-called fasting mimicking diets are emerging. The group of uh, Walt, Walter Longo suggesting that you know, these diets have really beneficial effect on health span, uh, even in humans. Now the key question is how, how do they work? And there are multiple possible mechanisms. And it is possible that the resulting effect is a combination of all of them. Of, of all mechanisms. So um, one is decreasing carbohydrate intake. Uh, so that would lead to decrease insulin signaling. Second one is restricting p protein intake, which would actually um, lead to uh, decreased store signaling and so on. The third one is uh, induction of ketosis, uh, which is uh, a s small nutrient, which is l generated by your liver. Uh, during the fasting process. And our work indicates that uh, just ketosis and the ketogenic uh, diet might have beneficial effect all by itself. And yeah, so you recently um, published a paper, your lab recently um, published a paper where you had taken mice, male mice, and give, given them a, a cyclic ketogenic diet. Yes. So that started in midlife. Yeah, actually, it started at one year old. Uh, one year old. So this okay. is about a third of their normal lifespan. So okay. that would be the equivalent of a thirty-year-old uh, human. Okay, and um, and and you found that it. So exactly what you found that they increased the uh, health span of these animals, yes. and yes. also there was some effect on the brain. Yes, very uh, interesting data uh, suggesting again. The whole experiment started on the idea, on the observation that there are many similarities between uh, what happens during ketosis on a ketogenic diet and what happens on calorie restriction. 
uh, or, or fasting. And so we, uh, with a, a colleague in the lab, John Newman, a number of years ago, we started asking the question, you know, could, would mice on, on a ketogenic diet live longer? So we um, spent about a year and a half with John trying to uh, identify the conditions where these mice would be on a fat and protein diet, essentially had zero carbohydrates after one year of age. Uh, the problem that we had initially is that they actually loved the stuff, so they would uh, just devour this, this diet and, uh, and it got fat. So we were worried that by becoming obese, we would sort of counterbalance the beneficial of effects of the ketogenic diet. So we spent a bit of time trying to solve this. Eventually, um, we're able to put them one week on, one week off. And uh, that resulted in a stable uh, weight uh, in the mice. And that allowed us to look at their health span and lifespan at the end of their lives. And what we saw was, um, uh, an increased medium lifespan, but about 10%. So the early mortality was decreased, but eventually they ended up having no increase in maximum lifespan. Uh, we also found a number of other uh, uh, variables associated with health span that were significantly increased, in particular memory. Uh, these mice, uh, the most remarkable thing we saw is that these older mice on, on the ketogenic diet showed actually better memory than younger mice. Uh, wow. And, and, and certainly did not see the loss of memory function that one would normally see yeah. associated with the aging process. So I think there was a pretty profound observation. Uh, I should say also John Ramsey and his colleague at UC Davis uh, conducted the same type of experiment, except that uh, instead of um, uh, putting the mice on a cycling one week on, one week off diet, they allotted fixed portions to the mice, so they couldn't overeat. They right. gave them the same amount of calories that they would have been eating had they been on a, on a normal diet. And so th these mice did not get fat and were continuously on the, on the ketogenic diet. And what they saw is essentially parallel to what we saw, but the effects were even a little better, which suggests that um, the cycling might have been actually a bit stressful for the mice over the long run. And so I think, um, we're very excited by these two studies because they, they were conducted independently. We found out only that we were pursuing the same thing right at the end at the time of publishing and then we decided to coordinate publication of the stories and they came out in the same journal together. So uh, I think they both reinforce each other. There is really clearly uh, uh, intriguing biology there happening. And, uh, and this was the first time that this had been reported. Wow, absolutely. It's very exciting. I read uh, your paper. I did not read the um, parallel paper. I did see the headline for it. But um, just to kind of go back to the, to the memory thing um, that your, your lab identified. So, you know, the, the ketone body that's, you know, the major circulating one that's generated is beta hydroxybutyrate. Yes. And um, that's involved in, in energy and metabolism, but also you have found, you know, it has other roles um, in addition to its role in energy meta metabolism, which we can talk about in a minute. But I, what are your thoughts as to why the, the memory, um, and, you know, the memory enhancement was so good or, you know, so robust? Do you think it has to do with energy metabolism, mitochondrial function, or do you know? Is we do not know, but that's the central question of everything we do right now with respect to the ketogenic diet is really trying to understand so beta-hydroxybutyrate is generated from our own fat during the fasting process. So when we start fasting, the body needs energy and we'll grab it out of our fat cells. Those fat cells release fat in the circulation. It goes into the liver and the liver transforms the fat into beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, why, why does it do this? Because our brain cannot use fat as a source of energy. Our brain can only rely on glucose or on beta-hydroxybutyrate. And so the, the, the way the system is geared up is the fat re gets released into the liver and the liver distributes the beta-hydroxybutyrate to the whole brain who can then use it and spare glucose. Right. And so uh, why, why do you want to spare glucose? The reason is that once you are fasting, at least for four hours, all of your the, the only way you can make glucose is from proteins. And so if you're f in a prolonged fast, you start uh, uh, digesting your muscles to make proteins, to make glucose. And you, cannot, you don't want to lose all of your proteins and all of your muscles. So the, the glucose sparing effect of beta-hydroxybutyrate is to spare muscle mass if you're fasting. 
So the system is really carefully engineered uh, to really generate a, a whole new way for your body to utilize energy when you're fasting. Right. Are you aware of the glucose sparing effect in the brain where, um, I know it's been shown with, at least in terms of uh, lactate, so the astrocytes in your brain do make lactate because they're glycolytic, yes. and the neurons will take it up, much like beta-hydroxybutyrate, they go through the same transporter. Yes, but, yes. Um, when when um, there's an abundance of lactate, and I don't I don't know if studies have been done on beta hydroxybutyrate in the brain, looking at this specific thing or not. But the the glucose sparing that occurs is um, the glucose gets shunted into the pentose phosphate pathway to make uh, NADPH, which yes. is then a precursor for glutathione synthesis. Yes. And so, the the idea is is that under like a traumatic situation, like traumatic brain injury. Um, when there's a lot of oxidative stress happening, you need glutathione to Absolutely. counter some of that. Yes. So um, it'd be interesting to see in your study if you can look at some of those pathways to see if they're upregulated or making more glutathione because brain aging kind of is like a traumatic insult, but like slowly chronic, yes. right? I mean, in a way. Well, you know, we published a paper. What got us into this field uh, was an observation that we published in Science in 2010 showing that so beta-hydroxybutyrate, in addition to being a nutrient, as we just discussed, is also a signaling molecule. Mm -hmm. And what we found at that time was that uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is quite similar to butyrate. Now, butyrate mm -hmm. is a byproduct of uh, bacterial fermentation mm -hmm. in our gut, actually. Right. And when we eat fibers, these bacteria will uh, digest the fibers into butyrate. And this butyrate actually circulates in many of us uh, as, 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 we, as we live. Um, the... Um, Butyrate was the first known or first identified inhibitor of HDAX, histone deacetylases, which are epigenetic regulators. And so that suggested that maybe beta hydroxybutyrate might be an endogenous regulator of these HDAX. Now, the reason why we were interested in HDAX is because they have been linked to aging as well. Their, uh, Steve Helfand's work has shown that an enzyme called RPD3 in yeast is actually a regulator of the sirtuins, which are themselves regulators of aging. So there's a pathway that's, that's in yeast that's been established, actually in Drosophila as well, uh, linking RPD3 to sirt 2 to aging, the aging process. And these HDAX that I'm talking about are in the same pathway. So that got us to start thinking, um, uh, what could beta-hydroxybutyrate be uh, also an HDAC inhibitor? And it was. And then this implicated it might actually be able to regulate gene expression. And some of the key targets that we found were uh, enzymes such as FOXO3, Fox, wow. which is uh, a major uh, sort of transcription factor in humans linked to aging. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that FOXO3 actually controls the response to oxidative stress. Right. So there's another link there that, that you know, brings uh, not only via the pentose phosphate yeah. and ADPH, but beta butyrate actually protects against oxidative stress, uh, as both as a nutrient, but also as a, uh, as a transcription or regulator. That's super cool. Do you know what, what levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate are required um, to sort of flip that switch? And so the, and this is probably, it's a very good question. It's probably one of the reasons why no one did the experiment before us. <laughs> it, it, uh, beta-butyrate and beta-hydroxybutyrate are poor inhibitors. They have very low efficiency as HDAC inhibitors. It's in the millimolar concentration. Mm -hmm. And as an inhibitor, nobody wants to work on millimolar uh, inhibitors because it, it's not potent enough. What most people did not realize is that the concentration of, of beta-hydroxybutyrate in your plasma or in your brain during fasting can go in the millimolar yeah. range very quickly. Right. And that's when I was reading a paper discussing these concentrations and was astounded. I thought, well, millimolar concentration, this means that it might really work as an HDAC inhibitor. And so we tested this by uh, putting a pump under the skin of uh, mice with beta-hydroxybutyrate and then measuring histone acetylation throughout the mouse. And we found that histone marks, acetylation marks, were going up, suggesting that there was indeed an inhibition of HDAC. And I think that was the turning point for By us. By giving them exogenous beta hydroxy Yes, rate. not even the fasting, because the fasting or a ketogenic diet is much more complicated than just giving beta hydroxy Right, and they were, they were on a normal chow diet. Normal chow diet, they were not fasted, and we found that uh, their ketone body levels were going very high in the millimolar range, and within a few hours, their histones were becoming hyperacetylated. And so that, for us, uh, uh, I think signified that 
here's a molecule that is produced during fasting under conditions that we know are, are, are good for your health. And so ketogenic diet has, has been uh, indicated, has been shown to have some beneficial effect under, no, no, uh, under a series of circumstances. All of a sudden, this, we had a potential signaling me mechanism, and that's what we've pursued. Yeah, that, I, I do remember seeing that paper. It was published in Science in yes. uh, yes. uh, 2010 or yes. something like that. Or, or 11, yeah. Ele yeah, I do, I do remember that paper. A very super cool paper. I actually talk about it quite often when I you know, want to talk about beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, so you were giving them, ex what do you think of exogenous ketone esters? Like, do you think that they're safe? I mean, I, how, is that something that you've, you've, uh, you know about or thought about? Well, we've thought about it. We, we are experimenting with them as well. Uh, it is one of the central questions. It's most of the beneficial effect that we have seen have been with the ketogenic diet, again, it's very different from a high beta-hydroxybutyrate level. Yeah. And uh, one of the remaining, or, or at least the next step in this whole field, is really to understand what can we re recapitulate with beta-hydroxybutyrate alone. And uh, I think uh, we're working actively on this, and so are, are many other groups. Because the, the, the <laughs> ketogenic diet itself, it's important to realize, is not an easy diet to 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 live on. I mean, there are, you know, I don't mean to be diminishing the, the merit, actually, I highlight the merit of people who are on a long-term ketogenic diet. It takes a lot of discipline. You basically cannot eat uh, a significant amount of carbohydrates. Uh, many people who have been on this diet for a long time actually tout its benefits and, uh, and, and, and the fact that they're uh, they, they feel very healthy and, uh, and they're, they feel very present. There are a lot of uh, brain effects linked to um, to, to, to uh, ketogenic diet. Now, big question is what can we replicate just by administering, uh, administering BHB, beta-hydroxybutyrate, alone? Yeah, I, I think that you're absolutely right, you know, and, and not to mention that with, uh, with the ketogenic diets, there's also, you know, some, some people can't really do them. Um, you know, there's certain gene polymorphisms. I know there's one in the PPR alpha which gene, which is important for the whole process of making yes. ketone bodies, and that people have that, they, they actually can't do that very yes. well, and so it can be sort of dangerous, and they can have inflammation. Yes. Sort of the opposite profile will happen, you know, so it's, it's certainly um, something to consider. And then, not to mention, like, you found in your paper that you just published um, this, this year, was it last month? Yeah. Yeah, it's last month. Yes. Um, that uh, you found, you know, there, there were multiple changes going on. There was a, I think, a, there was a decrease in insulin, obviously, yes. in IGF-1 and mTOR activity yes. went down. Yes. And, um, and then, you know, and, so and, that's something you're not going to just get from beta-hydroxybutyrate, maybe? We don't know. I don't We don't know. I suspect not for the mTOR part, but we also saw... Um, uh, we compared the ketogenic diet to a, a high-fat diet, which was not ketogenic. That is, there were, in which the mice ate a large amount of fat, but had enough carbohydrates to suppress ketogenesis. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest differences, I think, actually, between these two was the activation of PPAR-alpha. And this is also very exciting because that indicates that maybe a lot of the beneficial effect that we see on the ketogenic diet come from PPAR-alpha activation. And there's, you know, we've been reading that literature. There's seemed quite, quite, quite a bit of information there that really hasn't been pursued as a, as a next direction uh, to try to dissect these, these effects. Because, because PPR alpha is doing uh, something to the mitochondria. What, what's the main? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a key enzyme in the, of the fasting response, uh -huh. and but it seems to be more highly activated in response to the ketogenic diet than, than to a pure high fat diet. But what about fasting? If you compare fasting to a it is activated, diet. we just we you know we did not compare to fasting. We compared it. Just high, high fat, fat to, uh, yeah. but I think it, it just points to a, a new direction in which we can start dissecting uh, okay. uh, what is the role of people alpha in, in, in these responses. But with your diet, you also, you limited the protein intake and the, you didn't limit the caloric intake, that was the other study? No, the protein intake was uh, actually 10% uh, isocaloric 10%. between all of the diets that we tested and, and uh, for the, o the other group did the same thing. So we, made very, we were very caref careful not to change the, 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 the protein intake. And in the other group, actually, they did change a bit the, the, the protein content, which 
could be taken as a confounding variable. Right. So yeah. I think we, we, we were very careful in, in not changing the protein content. Is that standard for, um, you know, ketogenic diets have grown in popularity uh, and, you know, so it, do you think that, do you think that if the, the ketogenic diet you used, you hadn't have done a 10% protein if they had done a little bit more? I'm not sure if maybe that technically wouldn't even be a ketogenic diet, but I, would it have changed the IGF-1 mTOR axis as much? You, or? You're bringing an important point, which is that uh, a number of people who go on a ketogenic diet tend to compensate by increasing their protein intake, yeah. which might actually put them at risk from exactly what you're describing, increased IGF-1 signaling mm -hmm. and increase actually uh, risk of cancer. There's a really close correlation between your IGF-1 mm -hmm. level and your risk of can cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think... Um, this is something that needs to be considered in the future right, for yeah, people yeah. who are on a long-term ketogenic diet. And, and with, the, um, with the calorie restriction diets, well, I think I read, there was a study I remember reading that humans that end up doing caloric restriction, like there's the whole society of caloric restriction, yes. they end up eating a, they, they, they eat, you know, 30% less calories than they normally would or whatever, something like that. But they end up eating a higher percentage of protein because it's more satiating. So humans sort of naturally gravitate to eating more protein when they're eating less food. Yes. And so what's interesting is a lot of those, I think you even published a study recently looking at um, biomarkers of aging and lymphocytes or yes. monocytes. Yes, and we saw no difference right. between people and calorie restriction. This points again to, and this is something important to, discuss, to, to, to consider when a lot of the work that we do in the lab are done on mice that are uh, isogenic or congenic. So these are mice that are all similar to one another. When, when we, when take, takes uh, discoveries and, and bring, when you bring discoveries to the human population, uh, it, it is critical to take into consideration the incredible variation between different people and how they might respond to the same interventions. We know from everything that we've studied in medicine that, uh, I am not the same as you are, and, and, and you are different from your neighbor in, in, in many biological responses. And that includes response to calorie restriction. I suspect that in a number of people, it will actually do them harm, and in a number of people, it will do them good. We know this when we, strain, when we test different strains of mice in, by calorie restriction. Half of the strains actually responded by a shortening of lifespan, the other half by an increasing lifespan. So we, we take calorie restriction, for example, as a universal um, uh, modification that will increase lifespan. It's not what is uh, seen in the literature. And, um, and I would say the same is going to be even more true for humans. So I think this brings for me, brings up the, one of the key things that is lacking in the field of aging is the identification of biomarkers mm -hmm. that will allow us to test on an indiv individual basis whether the intervention or the modifications that you're imposing is actually pointing you in the right direction or in the wrong direction. And I, I would caution anyone who's considering doing something long-term in terms of their health to be very careful in how they feel and how, because we don't have these biomarkers of aging, they're emerging, mm -hmm. but they're not validated. It's certainly not in the human populations. They're emerging in mice models and other models. But um, that's really w where we will be going in the next few years, is really having true biomarkers that allow us to predict whether a given intervention is, is beneficial or actually hurtful. Yeah. What do you think that are there the top three right now we have for, for well, uh, biomarkers for aging? Well, there are, uh, there's, um, I can tell you the one that are really exciting me, there's um, Alexander Zhorankov as, as a company called In Silico Medicine that is building uh, biomarkers of aging based on facial recognition and, and based on metabolites. Um, just consider how... Metabolites, oh, that's Yeah, so con consider how you and I can look at, at a human and pretty much guess what their age is for yeah. most people. And consider the fact that where this is coming from is the fact that we've lived and we've met thousands of people and we've heard about their ages and we sort of built a database of information. So what... Alex and his company have done is they've um, taken the pictures of thousands of people and fed them to a deep neural network and artificial intelligence and the computer has been able to learn how to recognize and to link uh, on average what is the face of a, of a 70 year old versus a 60 year old 
So you can do this and it will tell you what the computer thinks your age is. And for some people you fall right on, but for a number of people you find that your, your age based on your face is actually looks younger or older. So this would be a reflection of your biological age. He's also been able to do this with the blood markers, with 20 or 30 or 40 blood markers, sort of usual blood markers by screening a large number of people, he can actually generate standard curves and then you can put in your blood values and see where you fit. So that's one approach. Um, BioAge is a company in the Bay Area uh, that is actually pursuing the same I idea, of uh, looking at artificial intelligence and, and biomarkers in, in plasma or in urine or and so on for, for, for identifying your age. Uh, and finally, one big area is the whole idea of the epigenetic clock. Yeah, uh, Steve Orvat. Steve Orvat yeah. and uh, Trey Eidecker. Uh, have shown that there are changes in, in DNA methylation that are that actually predict pretty closely your like chron chron chronological yeah, age. It's pretty cool. So I think all, all of those together are emerging as indica indicative that um, there are markers that we can reliably measure. Uh, the key is how many of those do we need? What are the, the how can we reduce this to something that's going to be very strongly predictor, not so much of your chronological age, but of your biological age? Right, yeah. I, I think there was a study I did read, maybe it was your the company that you mentioned, um, where they, there was um, a, a panel of blood biomarkers that they looked at, like telomere length and uh, immunosenescence and, you know, the standard panel. And then they looked, they, ha they had um, people, I think it was people that were asked to identify their facial age or something like that. Yes. And then they asked their chronological age and their facial age actually matched their biological age more yes. than their chronological exactly. or something like that. Exactly. So, we all know in, in our acquaintances, some people that actually look younger right. and some people that look older. Uh, and we, we know this because we have, we have a deep neural network in our head that has allowed us to build you know, a reference point so that we can pretty much guess how old people are. And the computer does it even more efficiently because it can be fed uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of pictures. That's and, cool. Uh, I want to try it out. Yeah, I, it is actually really cool. I, I just sent off my, um, I'm going to be getting my, uh, my telomeres tested, you know, just, I don't yes. know how reliable that's going to be, we'll see, but, you know, I've been getting uh, less sleep than usual because I'm a new mother and that's been shown to affect, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, anyways, I sort of, we digressed, I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, we're talking about fasting, we talked a lot about, you know, insulin signaling decreasing, um, IGF-1, we've talked about before in the podcast before uh, with you know, Walter Longo yes. and, and others, just how the protein restriction seems to really regulate that, and that also regulates aging process, mTOR as well. But um, something else that really seems to uh, change with fasting is the um, NAD levels. Yes. And that's something that, you know, your lab has studied extensively with um, the sirtuins. And yes. So maybe could you talk a little bit about, because NAD is also ex extremely exciting to me, and uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty popular these days as well. Yes. So NAD has emerged uh, as, a, as a, one of these critical uh, intermediary metabolites. Think of ketone bodies, uh, uh, NAD are all, uh, I call them currencies. I mean, uh, so think about your organism as a, as a country. Uh, you need to circulate energy, and uh, NAD is one way that our body is utilizing within the cell to, to convert, to transfer energy. It's almost like the Brinkman. Uh, truck that carries the money, and NAD can, can actually uh, is a so-called hydride acceptor. During uh, while we uh, oxidize food, it can actually serve as a as an acceptor for uh, an electron, and it can transfer them, for example, to the respiratory chain. So it's one way for the energy to be circulated within the cell. And there's growing evidence that um, its level decrease during aging. Uh, why that happens is still one of the big mysteries. And so this has yielded uh, a whole approach uh, that trying to understand first, what are the consequences of decrease in AD levels? Um, and one of the consequences is that enzymes like sirtuins, which rely on NAD to exert all of their beneficial activities, actually function less well. So that's what happens during aging. Um, but also many other enzymes that are involved in our metabolism are relying on NAD, and so they function less well. So your, your intermediary metabolism functions less well. The sirtuins, which are global regulators, function less well. Um, your the, uh, 
Anyway, so I, I lost. You're basically my, yeah. falling apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Essentially, you know, everything becomes a little less. Um, yeah. A little less efficient. Um, so out of this, these discoveries came the idea that maybe we should uh, replenish the, the decreasing level of NAD. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, this has yielded uh, some discoveries such as nicotinamide riboside, right. uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, which are now being taken by a lot of people and uh, with the hope that it will uh, you know, correct some of these problems. Yeah. I, one word of caution, I think, there is we do not know why these levels decrease. They could decrease because we have decreased production of NAD, but it could also decrease because we have uh, accelerated destruction of NAD, which means if you are, if it's ac accelerated destruction, bringing more into it is sort of like pouring more NAD in a leaky sink. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of our work right now is trying to understand what is the cause of the decrease in NAD uh, during aging. And because I think it will yield very different uh, solutions. If you find that there's a leaky sink, well, yeah. we'll work at filling, at, 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 at plugging the sink yeah. versus keeping pouring water. I, I have a theory. Yes. So I know, you know, coming from, uh, I did a lot of work with DNA damage. Yes. And um, knowing that one of the main enzymes. PARP. That, exactly. Yes. I mean, if you think about, you know, so one of the main enzymes that repairs damage as we age, um, DNA damage, um, PARP, it is, requires NAD, and it's like if you're accumulating more and more damage as you age, you have to repair more of that damage, and the more and more damage you're having, maybe it's sucking the NAD, you know, sort of like, sort of like almost a triage where it's like, well, you got to keep repairing that damage so then other things like the mitochondria suffer, or, you know, so. I completely agree, and actually that's, so there, there are two, two major theories right now that have been proposed uh, in terms of why does NAD go down. One is uh, ac uh, activated PARP, and indeed, as we age, we accumulate DNA damage. It's been shown, it's, you know, especially in the brain recently. Um, and so the idea is by activating PARP, you can, can constantly deplete your NAD levels. The second one is we all have in our body a so-called salvage pathway for NAD, mm -hmm. for NAD because NAD uh, turns over, there's a so-called salvage pathway that allows it to be recycled back to, so we can get NAD from the food, but also we salvage the one that we utilize. Right. And this salvage pathway has been shown to be, to becoming paralyzed uh, while you age. Mm. Uh, uh, there's an enzyme called an EMPT, it has received a lot of attention. That enzyme tends to be inhibited by chronic inflammation and, uh, okay. and a high fat diet. So one be way, so, right? so it could be a combination of both of these things, but it could be other mechanisms. Actually, we're working yet on another mechanism, which is that there might be accelerated destruction by other enzymes beyond PARP mm -hmm. and uh, getting some exciting results in, in, in this direction. Cool. So for people that are um, not familiar why, with why, like in terms of what role it plays, you know, in the aging process, you know, it seems as though, at least in some of the studies that I've seen, that mitochondrial function really seems to be important. And yes. I know that you've shown that the sirtuin-3 in the mitochondria itself seems to be really important for the mitochondrial function, keeping your mitochondria young. Um, and yes. that mitochondria play a very important role in aging as well. A critical role. The, you know, many of the aging pathways that we know, be it the unfolded protein response or mitochondrial biogenesis, all point to efficient mitochondria as one of the key, uh, the key ways to, to stay young. And, and, so, and one reason is because this is a, a way, so you can generate energy from glycolysis, which is glucose, carbohydrates, mm -hmm. which is we know is linked to aging, but also via mitochondria, via a process called oxidative phosphorylation. And that process is, uh, is not necessarily depending on, on glucose, but um, uh, is dependent on, on an efficient mitochondrial function. So we talked about NAD-dependent enzyme. Many of these enzymes reside in the mitochondria. And we found that, um, for example, uh, the NAD supplementation that uh, is being uh, tested in a variety of aging models requires SIRT3 quite often. This oh, really? mi mitochondrial SIRT2, and yes. Nicotinamide riboside does? Yes, yes. For, for example, the paper we've published uh, was focused on um, the age-associated uh, or noise-induced uh, uh, loss of hearing. So if you actually um, uh, subject mice or humans to very acute hearing, um, acute noise, they, they have a, a 
a, a, a dose dependent loss of hearing, you can protect mice completely from this effect by uh, supplementing with NAD. Wow. But with nicotinamide riboside. Uh, so if you're going to a, a rock concert right, and you want to protect yourself, and this is definitely something Harley that, Davidson writers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In mice, uh, it actually had a, a, an enormous effect. And we found that this effect was dependent on SOT3. So in SOT3, knockout mice, the effect was lost. Do you know if the, the um, if that was dependent, the SOT3 in the mitochondria of stem cells? Because in the, or was it just any cell? Or do so you not know? in the case of hearing loss, it's, it's dependent on some really uniquely sensitive cells okay. in, the, in, in the inner ear. But uh, uh, generally, there, there's been a sort of an assumption in the field that most of the effect of nicotinamide riboside, uh, protective effect, are dependent on SOT1. I think in, in oh really in, yes and uh, in some cases it is uh, in in this in this particular case uh, noise induced hearing loss it was really clearly so T three so even the studies that have looked at for example I think there's um they they did there was a uh, a mouse that had some sort of mitochondrial uh, disorder yes even that one was dependent on SIRT one. No, actually, I did, did not. In that case, the, I think the assumption was that it might be uh, helping global mitochondrial, mitochondrial function. And uh, so there's a growing number of, of cases, in, uh, for example, uh, DNA damage associated disease, where you see accelerated aging, where people have been testing the effect of supplementation. Because those conditions are associated with increased PARP activity, just like uh -huh. you mentioned. And... Uh, in those cases, I think it hasn't always been clearly mapped. What is the, the real target of, of uh, NAD that is dependent on the, uh, for the beneficial effect? Do you know if, um, so NAD levels do decrease with age. Do you know, has it been looked at, like, for example, in, in, in animals, like uh, in rodents, when they're fasted, because fasting increases NAD when they're fasting and they're older, does that, does that help rejuvenate the NAD to, irrespective of their age? Does it... Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good question. I think, you know, one thing that I, I remember also about fasting, another critical effect of fasting that we don't, that, that is really essential in our thinking is autophagy. Yes. And uh, so, you know, there's growing evidence also that autophagy by itself responds to nutrient availability. Mm -hmm. So NAD levels, uh, uh, acetyl-CoA levels. Mm -hmm. This is a new area that is, people are starting to work in, and including my labs, trying to understand what is it about acetyl-CoA, which is another, think about the uh, cur currency exchanger uh, in the cells, intermediary metabolite, that appears to have not only role as a nutrient, but also as a signaling uh, mm -hmm. molecule. Acetyl-CoA is in the Krebs cycle. It's one of the key um, uh, uh, intermediary product of the Krebs cycle. But it's also the substrate for a whole family of enzymes called the acetyltransferases, which are the opposite of what we were talking about the HDAX earlier. So yeah, I think yeah. there's really a lot of in, a lot of crosstalk between all of these pathways, and uh, we're working very actively now on on modulation of uh, signaling via acetyl CoA and these acetyltransferases, and not yet another approach is. Uh, uh, to mimic calorie restriction in the right. fasting state. Yeah, we, um, I had uh, Dr. Guido Kramer on the podcast. Yes, and, exactly. And exactly. he has been studying that as well. Um, you know, it brings up a question I remember I wanted to ask you that was sort of, you know, biology is never just black and white because I remember him, in with his work, he was talking about how important um, decreasing protein acetylation was So yes. for act activating autophagy, um, which happens yes. during fasting, but also during fasting you have these um, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is now, a, was, it, was it a class two inhibitor? Class one. Uh, class one yeah, inhibitor yes, yes. of the histone deacetylase. It's yes. kind of the opposite, a little? No, because no? you have okay. to think, so uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, it's one step above the sirtuins. And actually, the okay. class one inhibitors are inhibitors of oh, they're inhibitors of that exactly. makes sense. Exactly, okay. and uh, so it fits perfectly. If you go back to the so class one is an inhibitor of yes. histone deacetylase. Yes. Oh, that makes sense now. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you. There was a disconnect in my brain when well, I was it, trying it, to you know because it so the, the whole idea of if you think about acetyl CoA and and we, we really draw a graph that uh, of acetyl CoA regulating HAT histone acetyl transferase and NAD regulating the sirtuins. Mm -hmm. And these enzymes quite often say in, in opposition, not all of them, but 
one of the key players in terms of histone acetylene transferase is P300. And that's the one we've worked on and, and Guido Kromer as well has worked on. And uh, it makes sense. You, you get the same beneficial effects by, inhib by activating a sirtuins, which lowers acetylation, as you do by inhibiting an acetyl transferase, which also lowers acetylation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the message is that nutrient feeding or you know, uh, low histone acetyl transferase activity or high sirtuin activity all lead to low protein acetylation, which is beneficial. And, do, and ke doing the ketogenic diet? Regulates one step above. Does also, yeah. Yes. And, but uh, obviously there's some complexity because there are some histone marks that are depending on one enzyme. So this is an yeah. oversimplified model, but uh, so far it holds. What about autophagy with the ketogenic diet? Is that something, I mean, okay. I don't know if it would be... It would be activated because yeah. it, clearly it's a fasting mimicking diet, but we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, really studied it directly. Mm. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting yes, to look absolutely. at. Also, the other thing, the other question I would have was, you know, there's a lot of stress on on the liver yes. when you're when you're doing that sort of diet, right? You're relying on it for gluconeogenesis to make glucose, yes. oxidizing fat. And do you know if there's any? Has anyone looked at sort of long term ketogenic diets? Yeah. And we did. Uh, the liver seemed perfectly fine. Just imagine the liver is really think about it as a sort of an energy redistributor. Uh, if it's not dealing with fat from uh, during fasting and transforming fat into keto ketone bodies, it is dealing with food coming in from the yeah. intestine during feeding. Yeah. So it's always busy yeah, yeah. in one way or the other. So I don't think that there's anything to be worried about it being generating ketosis. I haven't heard of any uh, side effects linked mm -hmm. to you know liver function and so on. Mm -hmm. The other thing would be. Um, with, at least with mice, in your study, you did cyclic, and the parallel study, they did, I guess, continuous, but they restricted the calories. But, you know, mice sort of, and this is something that goes back to something that Guido was talking about in the podcast, they have a notoriously fast metabolism. In fact, he said that if you fast a mouse for 48 hours, they can lose, like, up to 20% of their body yes. weight, which is, like, phenomenal. I mean, if yes. a human could do that, there'd be no obesity, you know? Yes. But, uh, so do you think that, that the fast metabolism... Um, you know, coupled with something like the ketogenic diet, or even just a lot of the fasting studies in general, is something that can, like, if we if we we see something like an increase in health span, and we see all these positive benefits in rodents, is that something that we may have hope in translating to humans? I, you think? I, I do think. So. I mean, it's important to realize that mice are not humans, and that there is a tall order in terms of proving something that has happened in mice mm -hmm. all the way to humans. But that's our mission. I mean, that's what we need to do. And you have uh, mechanisms. We have mechanism. You know. That's the first step. Yeah. Uh, it's not always predictive. And large number of drugs that have been shown to be efficient in mice have failed into humans. But that's the first step that we can we can take. And I think uh, for more work. I think the next next logical step is to go in, in humans and, and test. Is is the ketogenic diet something that you have considered trying or doing? I, or I have are? tried. I have okay. tried, and. I, I, been on it for about a year. It is. Uh, it's hard to stay on. I, I call it a somewhat antisocial diet because you, you can't really drink alcohol. You can't eat uh, a lot of the things that we base you know our social interactions on. No bread, no pasta, and very little fruits. Um, I think it's. Uh, it's, what about vegetables? Uh, you can eat some vegetables, but you know depending which ones. Uh -huh. uh, so I think it. I, I view this uh, on, a, on a global population basis as not a realistic goal to, to expect that everyone is going to be on this mm -hmm. ketogenic Are diet. you going to continue doing it? Or? No, I'm not, I'm not on it right no. now. And I think I find that uh, intermittent fasting is a much, a much easier way to... Is that uh, something you practice? Yes. yes. Um, not, not right now, but I yeah. have intermittently. So yes. intermittent fasting... Um, like 12 hours, 16 hours, or 24 hours? Well, this, this is still a growing uh, question. Um, there's really interesting work coming out at the Salk Institute on, on uh, so-called so time-restricted uh -huh. eating, time-restricted feeding, uh, showing that uh, it's not just how much you eat or what whether you're eating carbohydrates, but it's also um, how often you eat and how allowing every day for a, a fasting period. 
I think that's probably some of the most important work that we've seen recently in this whole field. And, uh, you know, just think about what uh, dietary authorities today are recommending is three meals and three snacks. I think based on what we are doing and learning, this is the worst possible way that you can possibly uh, eat. So I think allowing for each day uh, to have these uh, really restriction mm -hmm. in terms of calorie intake allows you to activate all these pathways to suppress insulin secretion, to suppress store, to uh, activate autophagy. All of these, I think, are really uh, critical. I've, yeah, I've, I've um, in complete agreement with you. I've talked to uh, Dr. Sachin Panda a couple of times on yes. the podcast, um, phenomenal researcher, and I've been doing time-restricted eating yes. ever since I first uh, yes. spoke with him. Um, of course, when I was pregnant, I sort of couldn't do it as well, yes. but but I'm, I'm back doing it now, and you know, I do I do feel um, much better when I do it. You know, I try to eat all of my food within a 10-hour window. Yes, and um, I find yep. that that's the best. 14 hours is 14 uh, hours is, fasting. Yes. Yeah, and I know that you know. I think maybe you can answer this question for me, but you know, it takes anywhere between like 12 to 36 hours to deplete your liver glycogen or something like that. Actually, it can be faster. Yeah. From, what from four to six hours, you actually oh really most of it. Yes. Does it depend on your physical uh, activity levels? Yes, and things like that? obviously, uh, yeah. physical exercise will deplete it much more quickly. In terms of entering ketosis, you actually. So if you bore to do 14 hours, it's not enough to really gain significant ketosis. You start seeing this at about 16 hours uh -huh. where your level will slow, slowly rise. Okay. So, yeah, so doing a 14-hour fast every night is, is something that I at least try to practice. Yes, no night cap. I think that's the easiest. Yeah, no night no cap. No night cap, no uh, you know, glass of milk with no. a spoon of sugar no going wine. to bed. But you get used to it. Yes, you absolutely. Know, you really do. Yes. And um, you know, like I said, I think it's the easiest. I haven't really done a prolonged fast yet. I've I've spoken with uh, Dr. Walter Longo, and and um, you know, he was talking about the prolonged fast in in humans. Like in mice, I think it's like 48 hours, but in humans, it's a little like it's four, five day, days. four or yeah. five days. Yes. Yeah, and so he's got this fasting mimicking diet, yes. which sort of mimics some of the some of the effects of fasting. Um, I know several people that have done water fast. I haven't I haven't braved it yet. Uh, have you tried doing a prolonged fast? Well, I've done, you know, Walter, Walter Longo's diet, okay. prolonged diet. How was that? that? It's, uh, it, it's really, I think it's uh, really interesting uh, science. I think it's, I, what I like about it is the fact that it, um, it really takes this fasting to a scientific level. That is, by yeah. they're doing the work. One key question is that, so going on this five-day diet is actually an interesting experience because it's not hard. Maybe on day three it might be a little hard, but... One key question that has not been addressed is if you induce this re protective response, how long does it last? Mm -hmm. And so how often should you do this? Is it something you should do uh, you know, every three months or every once a month or actually once every six months? I think this is the type of information that will allow many of us to really you know, do the intervention when it's needed. And uh, I think it's, it's going to be a lot of research in, in this whole area that I'm, I'm very excited about. Yeah, it probably depends also on how, you know, do you do time-restricted eating every day? And do you, you know, so what you, what your sort of baseline is, are you, are you like obese or overweight yes. or, you know, metabolically healthy? And, but I agree with you. I think it's an extremely exciting field. And um, being here at the Buck Institute, um, you know, for research on aging, you're sort of at the, the forefront of it all. And, um, you know, like you said, you're, you're, there's so many different aspects of, of the aging biology that's being researched here. Yes. Um, if people want to learn more about your work and, and the book. Um, yes, so we, are, uh, we were the first uh, research institute devoted to, uh, to aging. Uh, we were founded in 1998, and uh, we have about 220 employees, uh, all focused on aging. And we, we take great pride in the fact that we, we start at the very simple, most simple model, yeast, we go to uh, C. elegans, uh, nematode, we go to uh, fruit flies, mice, and um, humans now. And uh, one of the, the, the things that really excites me about the buck is the fact that we, we have built this incredible body of knowledge over the last 20 years in terms of the basic biology of aging. And I think the field has moved to the point that we're, we're really ready to start translate this, translating all of this into humans. And, and we're seeing, all of us are seeing, you know, the incredible interest from pharma and venture capital in terms of investing in the aging space. And um, 
I think we're, you know, we're really well positioned to be riding that next wave, which is going to be bringing all of these incredible discoveries into humans. And uh, so stay tuned. I'm certainly going to stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time. My to pleasure. To My pleasure. That was great.